So Owen, uh, it's that time. We love specific stock chat and uh, you've been kind enough to always share your time and, and some of the stocks that are on your watch list. But I guess keeping in mind what we've just discussed about value investing and and uh, the evolution, uh, what what's the company or this one hidden software stock that's coming across your screens at the moment and really um, ticking a lot of the boxes for you? Yeah, sure. So this is actually one company that... Um, it's in my top five holdings. So full disclosure, I actually own this company. And the reason that it has got there is because I've held it for quite some time. So I didn't just go in all guns blazing. And I think that's really important because this is a smaller company. It's about $400 million uh, or just just over when you, um, if you have the market cap, the market capitalization. But if you exclude the cash that it has on its balance sheet, um, it's around about 400 million Australian dollars. This is a company called RPM Global. Now, it's really important. We chatted off air about this. Please do not get confused. There is a company which trades under the ASX ticker symbol RPM. It is not that. <laughs> this is RPM Global, trades under the ticker symbol RUL. And what does it do? RPM Global is a mining software business. Now, it sometimes gets caught up in the mining services and mining consulting because that's where it started in the 1970s. It started as an, an advice giver to mining engineers, to mining owners, all these different uh, types of players in the resources sector. And over time, what it did was it realized that software is going to play a bigger part in the way we manage mines, the way we optimize mines, the way we plan for mines. And so it started to build its own software. It started to buy software, but it wasn't really into, until 2012 when it really changed gears. Behind the scenes, uh, I guess an IT professional, an enterprise professional named Richard Matthews took the helm of RPM Global. And he comes from an IT enterprise background. So he saw all of the challenges in mining that could be solved with software that talks to other software. And it basically he said about building so this software that could be sold on subscription to help miners plan, to help them design. Imagine those big things that look like Tonka trucks. Every time that takes an ineffective route around the mine, it's wearing down the tires. And those tires aren't cheap. And they maybe take a day or two to replace. Every one of those you know, routes that it takes during the day with a full load could be minimized and then ultimately save money. So this is like what we call asset maintenance tracking. Uh, it's one of the pieces of software that RPM Global is known for. And that's basically what's happened is the business from there has taken it in its stride to increase its spending on mining and increase uh, sorry, increase its spending on software and create a full suite of software that can talk to other pieces of software at the mine site. And this is a, a really interesting business and it's still early in that journey. Is this a company that is um, has its software being used at some of the big miners in Australia, like the Rios, the BHPs, or is it at the smaller end of town? Yeah. Yeah, so all of those that you mentioned, uh, Rio Tinto, Glencore, BHP, uh, I think Anglo's in there too. Basically, all of the biggest miners in the world. So yeah, use wow. some or like some of its software at some mine somewhere in the world. And so the, the, the really interesting thing about mining software, and, and Richard Matthews talks about this, is miners tend to be what we call fast followers. So they don't want to be the first one that uses the software because if something goes wrong, it's a pain in the backside to get it out. So what they effectively do is they, it's like they, they have foundation partners for their software. They say, we're going to build this software and we, want, we think it's perfect for you. But here, we'll build it together. We'll work with you to build it so you don't have to take the risk. And then what we'll do is we'll then take that as a case study and then sell it to other miners who want to follow in your footsteps. It's a fantastic way to think about selling the, the subscriptions because miners are often averse to subscriptions too. So it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting concept coming and selling this software into mines, but they've done a really good job since 2012. Uh, what we've seen is the software, if you look in the segment report in the annual report, this is in the notes to the financial statements, you'll see it. The software division has been profitable for many, many years, but it's the advisory and the consulting side of the business, which has been ebbing and flowing with uh, commodities prices. Yeah, well, right. So we're seeing it take over now. Well, Owen, I was going to ask you about that because for the last four years, it's made about $70 million a year, every year, 73, 79, 78, 66. And it, was, it hasn't turned a profit for the last couple of years. Um, mm. When we think, when, you know, when we started here, we spoke about companies that are growing quickly. That revenue line doesn't, doesn't look like it's a, uh, it's going in the right direction. Uh, can you talk to that? Mm. Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. And I like the, the harder question. So um, about, I think it's about off the top of my head, about 90% of its software is now sold on subscription. And this is a classic 
um, I guess, shift to software as a service. So what happens is typically when you sell software or historically when you would sell software, you might, you know, you'd be familiar with this if you got the old Microsoft Office disk, you'd pay a hundred bucks and you'd get it for life or whatever. And then they shifted to Microsoft 365 where you pay a bit every month. And what actually happens in that process is you actually cannibalize your revenue because you're effectively taking future year's revenue and you're taking it um, in monthly or quarterly or yearly blocks. And so what we can see, if you dig into the presentations, you'll see that RPM Global's, the predominant timeline or, or I guess amount that's left on the contracts for its software is three to five years. So they're effectively saying, don't pay us all of that upfront. So our revenue is not going to grow today, but we'll take it in the future because you're contracted legally to us. And that's why you don't see that budging. And that's where we're seeing that shift in the mix. I'll give you um, one statistic, which I found really interesting. Um, they made an update to the market in February, 2022. And what they said was we've sold 31, I think it was $31 million of um, subscription software revenue or so sorry, software um, this year, this financial year. So that was what, like seven months, right? They now have $81 million uh, banked for the future. So that shows you how quickly they're moving. 31 just in seven months versus 81 overall. And so they're growing that future pipeline very quickly. Mm. Nice. And then uh, one other question from me, Owen. Uh, I don't want to be the guy that's asking all the hard questions, but hey, someone's got to do it. (laughs) Um, uh, So we obviously are living through a great commodity cycle at the moment in Australia. Um, Iron ore has done well coal did really well last year uh some of australia's big commodities were hot around the world uh how much is this company exposed to the uh commodity cycles and how do you think that would go if iron ore coal fall um from here yeah i think it would be volatile and i don't think that investors would like that so that's probably the first thing um the other thing to keep in mind though is that as they bank more of these subscriptions they're getting that annuity like income So it's not, you know, immune to those experiences. What we see is that when commodity prices uh, fall, we see that advisory and the consulting revenue, which is still a big chunk of their revenue, fall away because that predominantly works in like the M&A space. So when they give consulting um, advice, it's to people that want to merge or start new minds or whatever. And that we'll see that fall away pretty quick. And that's a pretty ugly side of the business, but we should see that software continue to grow. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is they're launching new products. So they're becoming more valuable to existing customers. And the final thing is a lot of people lump this business in with other mining exploration companies. It's not that. They don't necessarily do as much work in that. They're more in the scheduling and maintenance side and optimization side of, of mining. So more like existing mines, mines that have already been committed to. So they've got those three to five year plus contracts that should see them good stead through the ebbs and flows of commodity prices. So Owen, we've just uh, we've just spoken about writing down a thesis and asking yourself what sucks. So you've given us the the bull case for for the stock. What what's the what's the bear case? What's the part that sucks about this? Yeah, so the business has to keep growing. I think they're on track to do about $80 million of revenue in the financial year. It's a $400 million business and it's uh, tr- you know expected to do a revenue of about $80 million. So that's five times sales. The business, is, as Ren pointed out, overall is not profitable from like a, a total consolidated profit and loss statements perspective. So it's important to keep in mind that valuation is pretty rich. And if we do see sentiment shift away, we're seeing all of these tech stocks kind of get whacked. Um, the other thing is, I think the business, while they probably wouldn't say this, is pretty dependent on their CEO, Richard Matthews. He's a very, if you see him present, he's a very like charismatic and a very optimistic leader. And I think he does a really good job of attracting and inspiring engineering talent to come into mining, which is typically not where they want to be. And so I think he's kind of like this visionary. Fortunately, when he became CEO, he actually bought a heap of stock in the business. So the the chance of him leaving is pretty low, but it is a risk. Um, the other bit, the other thing that I just want to highlight is that it has to grow. It basically has to grow to justify the valuation. For, as, as you guys have alluded to, it hasn't at the top line. So we really want to see that growth uh, pick up and go forward. Uh, and one more thing is acquisitions. They've made a lot of acquisitions over the years to complement their internal R&D. Um, they've made some divestments as well. But the, fortunately, the acquisitions have been small um, and have complemented the existing uh, infrastructure. If they start to get their kind of, I don't know, if they get a bit too heavy handed in their acquisitions, we could see that go go badly. So uh, those are some of the things that I'm watching. Mm. So, uh, Owen, I'm just scrolling through the um, 
the RPM Global's website and looking at all the different software systems they have there. And it is so that some of them are so specific. There is one software solution, which is the underground potash solution software. So, and it just got me thinking about moats. Like it feels like these guys have a pretty solid head start in a pretty niche industry. Uh, When you think about moats uh, for this business, what comes to mind? I'd say the stickiness. So the stickiness of existing customers means that it's like mission critical software. Um, the, other th- the other thing is the, the mining industry, they are kind of a leader. I'm not going to say they're the leader. They, re- they, re- they do work with like the likes of SAP and integrate with like big enterprise uh, resource planning software. And so um, the more, I guess, in bed they get with those big ERP systems, the better and more sticky their software becomes. So I would like to say that in time they have pricing power the true sign of a moat, regardless of what type of moat it is, is the ability to attract customers and increase prices, or at least retain customers. If you can do both, that's the sign of a moat. And so I would suggest that we will see them you know, incrementally have those prices increasing over time while also retaining customers, which is the key insight there. And I think that's going to come from the fact that once you've installed the software, once it's working with the designers who are offsite, you know, all of the, the project managers who are on site and everyone's using it and familiar with it, it's pretty hard to get rid of project management software and, and anyone would tell you mm, that. Yeah, the switching costs are very high. So look, even if it's got a moat, if it doesn't have a big market to grow into, it can still not be a great investment. It can be raising prices on a small uh, number of customers and uh, be limited. So I guess my, my final question about this company is, uh, is it, is it primarily Australian or is it, uh, does it, is it servicing miners around the world? Like when we think about total addressable market for a company like this, is it every mine in every country in the world or is it more limited than that? Well, it's traditionally focused on things like thermal coal, um, copper and those types of things. So those are, you know, in themselves, they're multi-billion dollar industries um, and you're right like the, the software is somewhat specific i think if you exclude exploration software too it becomes a bit more narrower so software for exploration i think off the top of my head when i went back and did this a few years ago i think it's about 700 million dollars a year that was the estimate of the tam for that uh, and this is you know this is more i guess more niche as you say but it's still got a, a tam i believe that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars they're not going to get all of that there's no way that they'll get all of that um there are incumbents they are one of the leaders in this space Space. And what we've seen recently, Ren, is there's also strategic value in these businesses. So we've seen a couple, and there's one here in Australia, actually, that was a big mine design and scheduling software provider um, that actually got taken over. So, and, and it got taken over for a pretty hefty multiple. And so they even made comment on this in the, in the re- most recent report to say that there has been a lot of our competitors being consolidated into bigger uh, enterprises. And that, that's something that's in the back of my mind too, is that even if they don't realize the full potential, they could be strategic acquirers for this business. Mm. 